Last week, we began uh, this series of shows on Mexico splendors of 30 centuries. And this is the second part of it. Uh, this was an exhibit that was presented in the Metropolitan Museum in New York 30 years ago. And then it traveled to San Antonio, LA, Monterrey, and Mexico. And it is perhaps the most important art exhibit Mexico has ever organized. It had uh, everything from Olmec heads uh, to colonial art, uh, to objects from altars they brought to the most beautiful silver. And it had also uh, masterpieces of Diego Rivera, Orozco Siqueiros, uh, Frida Kahlo, and, and many more artists. So that exhibit 30 years ago somehow started my career as a public speaker. At the time, I was a young official in the Embassy of Mexico. And this Smithsonian that was organizing uh, they had this program in which they organized museum visits and so on. And so they were planning a trip, a bus trip from Washington DC to New York to see the exhibit, which is about maybe a ride about four hours. And so they wanted a person from the embassy to give them a brief introduction of what they were going to see. That was what they had requested. But uh, when I heard about it, I decided to do something completely different. Uh, I remembered reading all about uh, the Beatles magical mystery tour in which they take this bus ride and make it this kind of joyous ride. And so I decided that I was gonna try to do the same. And so I got a bus that had speakers and had screens and instead of giving them a five minute introduction, I decided to give them the whole historical context of Mexico. So it was a lecture that lasted the four hours from the beginning to the, our, our arrival in New York. We went all the way and then after the, the exhibit, we had, it was a beautiful experience. And then we returned and we shared Mexican music and it was lovely. Uh, it was like 12 hours of culture. And that day was very important for me because uh, after that, I started getting sent to do lectures here and there. And eventually I found that the lectures were my vocation. Who, who, who thought about that? Who could imagine that a person could decide to leave everything and dedicate himself exclusively to doing lectures, which is what I have done. And now a year into this pandemic, this is exactly a year since, we, since I started, when I thought that you know my all my contracts were canceled, and now I've been doing these lectures through uh, Zoom. And so uh, this is the second part. Last week, we saw, you know, the Mesoamerican art. We talked about the colonial art and of the early 19th century art. So we left it right after the revolution. And we were talking about a, a man that I keep mentioning in my presentations called Jose Vasconcelos. And I wish we had somebody like that today because I think that what he, his solution for Mexico would work in the US. As a matter of fact, uh, it did. You know, when President Franklin Roosevelt created the New Deal, he adopted a lot of Vasconcelos' ideas in the efforts of putting money into culture and arts. And as you remember here in the United States, there was this wonderful program that created murals in many schools and many public buildings. 
And this was a direct inspiration of Vasconcelos. Vasconcelos believed that art is not something that should be relegated only to the museums and only to those people that have the, the privilege of going to galleries and so on. He believed that art should be part of life and that the best way to do that was to create public murals in office buildings, but especially in schools. Vasconcelos believed that the arts were fundamental in the educational process and that arts made education better because by reading uh, novels and reading essays and looking at paintings and looking at poetry, it is easier to understand history, to put a context on things uh, and to make the whole process more lively and more interesting. So I think that one of the problems that we have today is that art has no place in public life, right? If you are a person that goes to museums and you know has that tradition, it is almost like a personal journey. But in most schools, there is not a single work of art and uh, programs of teaching people to paint or even do music have been relegated to after school at best. And I think that our entire system suffers for, for, from this. So uh, under Vasconcelos, and he was the secretary of education. This is the way that libraries looked. In other words, instead of just having a place where people could go out there and do whatever immediate function, like in this case, consulting a book, you don't really need to have a mural there. But certainly putting the entire history on the wall makes that place livelier and more interesting. And so that is what happened in Mexico, that everywhere in public schools and libraries and hospitals, in buildings, uh, they, were, they became full of art. And, and this created uh, opportunities for many artists that suddenly were receiving work. They paid them like they did, um, you know, a, a worker. But suddenly there was work. And the most famous muralists, we, we know that we're going to talk about them, which are Diego Rivera, Siqueiros, and Orozco. But I would like to insist that this is much broader than them. This was an entire movement that uh, gave artists in Mexico an unprecedented uh, activity and importance. So before we talk about these muralists, I would like to talk about those immediately before them. And for some, the John the Baptist of Mexican art is Gerardo Murillo, Dr. Adel, as he called himself. Uh, Dr. Adel, Adel means water in the indigenous language. And so he adopted that pseudonym. Uh, and he had been in Europe, he had lived in Italy, and he had seen the great murals of the Renaissance. And he himself was more of a landscape artist, beautiful paintings like this. But when he returned to Mexico, he became a, a professor and he was teaching in the school of San Carlos that is Mexico's most important art school. And he insisted in revolutionizing the way uh, artists taught. And instead of just this very limited conservative way of keeping the students, you know, always inside the, 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 the walls of the school, he started uh, promoting taking the artists outside, having them see the world around them. 
and painting not only the exercises of most of the time, you know, they learn to draw by painting like models that existed in the school. So he started taking them out, having them look around, looking at people, looking at the reality in Mexico. And then in 1910, uh, Mexico got ready to celebrate the centennial. At the time, Mexico was governed by Porfirio Diaz. And so the country uh, got ready to do a, 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 a celebration of enormous proportions. New buildings were inaugurated, new monuments. And among the, the activities that had been scheduled was a great exhibit of Spanish art. So Gerardo Murillo rebelled against this and said, well, wait a minute. How is it possible in our centennial that you're doing an exhibit for Spanish art? Isn't it our independence from Spain, what we are celebrating? So Gerardo Murillo insisted that it was fine to bring great Spanish art, but it was also important to give a space and a budget for the young artists of Mexico to show their work. And he succeeded at this. And so in many ways, he galvanized a generation. You see Gerardo Murillo, Dr. Adel at the center, he's the man, the bald man. And so all this generation, in which you had these young artists that later would become very famous, like Diego Rivera, like Orozco, were summoned by Gerardo Murillo to work like they had never worked before. And the selection of the works was done in a democratic fashion with everybody voting openly. And so as a result, for the first time, these young Mexican artists had a space. And for the first time, side by side, the exhibit of the Spanish artists, you had another one by Mexican artists. So that is a direct contribution of Gerardo Murillo. The second one was a contribution that would take longer, but what, what he had seen in Italy, and he had seen how during the Renaissance, artists had been given walls, mainly in chapels, to do murals. And so he asks the government to give him, well, not him, walls for the artists to do murals in. So this would take more than 10 years to happen, but it was him who planted that seed. So he would be, I would say, uh, a figure without whom probably the course of Mexico not would have taken a very different direction. Now, I also want to mention Francisco Goitia. And at the time, most of the Mexican artists were trying to paint and to work in the same way that the French or the British. Some of them even dressed like the French. You know, they wore these capes, they wore this kind of bohemian outlook. But from the very beginning, Francisco Goitia, instead of looking at these European models, looks at the Mexican people. And he does these paintings where he shows us the desperation and the poverty. This work is called Tata Jesucristo, Daddy Jesus. And you see these two women that are desperately poor. So Goitia is not a political activist. He, he doesn't, he's not a Marxist. He doesn't belong to any party or union. But he's probably the first to look 
not only at Mexico, because other artists like the ones we shared uh, last week, you know, we shared the works of Jose Maria Velasco that had seen Mexican landscape, or Hermenegildo Bustos that had seen Mexican people. But Goitia looks at the social reality of millions of Mexicans. And he paints without the expectation of, of selling anything, but as a, as a testimonial of what life was for many people in the country. And his commitment is such that Goitia ends up giving everything he owns to the poor and living like a homeless. Because he felt that he had to share the life of those people that he painted. So somehow the, the example of Goitia would become also an element in the, the next generation of Mexican artists. And this idea that artists have a social obligation that they cannot ignore the misery and, and the desperation of so many people and that they cannot pretend that they're living in London or in Paris or in Rome. I would say that if Dr. Adel provides the core belief of Mexico as an entity and the opportunity for Mexican artists and fights for walls, Francisco Goitia provides a social awareness that would be very important. And the third great artist before the muralist was a Saturnino Erran. He was the most gifted, technically extraordinary, uh, with an incredible hand for drawing. Uh, and all of his colleagues believed that he was the most talented of their generation, that he would be Mexico's great painter. He even did a project for a mural called Our Gods. And in the center of that mural, he did this figure where you see the Aztec goddess of the Cuatlicue and superimposed the image of Jesus. And this was going to be a beautiful mural. But tragically, Saturnino Herrán died when he was only 31 years old. And he died in an awful way. He, he had a, a throat cancer. And so he lost his ability to eat. So he literally died of starvation. And Saturnino Herrán is an example of technical accomplishment, of uh, an artist that could draw and could paint like the best of the world. So I would say that those, uh, and, and a fourth influence would be Alfredo Ramos Martinez. And Ramos Martinez has this vision of Mexico. He is also a, a director of the school. And sadly, his daughter gets very sick. And the only way to cure her was to coming to the US. So he abandons Mexico and comes to live in California. There's some murals of him here. And nowadays, 
his works are very much valued in Sotheby's and Christie's and all these great auctions, but he is practically unknown in Mexico. But Ramos Martinez introduces themes that would later be developed by the muralists. So these would be before the muralists and now let us look at the most famous Mexican artist. And I would say that in the next weeks, we're gonna be looking at them individually. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna next, next uh, Saturday, we're gonna talk specifically about Diego Rivera and then Orozco and then Siqueiros. But I wanna give you a brief presentation of each. Orozco, uh, Jose Clemente Orozco, had started his career as a cartoonist. So he had learned to be very distrustful of the words of politicians. And he takes this vision, this critical vision that he had developed of society into his works. So for example, here you see a general and you see the vanity of the man and the sycophants around him. And it is also very important that he sees what no other artist was seeing. Among other things, how within the left, there was resurging a new form of oppression. That of the union leaders and the party members and the same the, the Stalinist structure of the Soviet Union that had become not a liberator, but an oppressor of the working class. And Orozco is the only one that sees this type of oppression. And he criticizes that. He sees the masses that are blind to the oppression, that stick their head in the mud like ostriches. And what he proposes as a solution is not ideology or dogma, but thought. In one of his murals, he proposes this man that has five faces uh, as, as a symbol of somebody that can see a problem from many different perspectives. In other words, the solution is not dogma, but creativity, intelligence, analysis. And Orozco leaves us with some of the most powerful images of Mexican art. Among them, the man in flames that is in Guadalajara in the Hospicio Cabañas. The second muralist I would like to discuss is David Alfaro Siqueiros. And Siqueiros was the most hardcore militant of the three. He was uh, uh, not only a member of the Communist Party, but a dedicated Stalinist. He was a, a man that believed in the most hardline form of communism. And for his politics, Siqueiros was constantly jailed and exiled from many countries. And his politics are so controversial. Siqueiros is a man that when Trotsky, the Soviet leader, was given asylum, Siqueiros personally tries to execute Trotsky. Fortunately, he fails, but that gives you an, an idea of his belief system. And uh, sadly, because his politics are so controversial, often people have not looked at the greatness of his art because Siqueiros was a revolutionary, not only in, in life, but also 
in art. And he pro proposes a lot of things that are fascinating. For example, using new materials, using like uh, uh, this compressor of paint to apply to large surfaces. And he uses new types of paint with which he can get incredible reactions like the ones we are looking at in this painting. It'd be impossible to get that effect of an explosion had he limited himself only to conventional oil paintings. Uh, Siqueiros also experiments with the movement of the paintings. He creates images that seem to come out of the painting, like a foreshortening of the image. You know, images that seem like, like in this case, that the fist is coming out and grabbing us. And he also experiments with images. If we move from one side to the screen to another, you will see how these images follow you. So he would create some of the most interesting murals. Murals that appear to move as we walk. It's something incredible. Uh, but unfortunately, many of Siqueiros' contributions have not been used or applied because of the controversy of his politics. And the third great muralist, and we're going to have a whole presentation on him next week, is the most famous one, which is Diego Rivera. Diego Rivera spent many years in Europe. He was a good friend of Pablo Picasso uh, and one of the members of the Cubist school. So he learned all the modern techniques. But when he comes back to Mexico, Diego Rivera fully embraces the Mexican people and paints them lovingly. He does these images of the indigenous people that had been discriminated, that had not never been included in art. And he makes them the central theme of his works. Now, at the same time that we have these great muralists that are painting on gigantic walls, that are doing all these themes of history, of social justice, we have an other group of artists, some of them intimately connected to the muralists, some of them like married to them, that are not looking at this great panorama, but rather are looking inside. And some of these artists are wonderful women artists. The most famous today is Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo would be married to Diego Rivera and she would often paint herself, but not only herself, but also her suffering. Frida would have a terrible accident and would live a life of constant pain. She would have her spine fractured. And so she paints her suffering in the art. He makes us experience what she is feeling. And not only she paints her pain, but also her experience and her duality. Now, there's several other great female artists that have never been given internationally the fame they deserve. Among them, I would like to mention Maria Izquierdo. Maria Izquierdo, as a teenager, had literally joined the circus. And so her works have this beautiful, nostalgic tone of the circus. She paints these scenes of, of, of the horses and the acrobats and the clowns. And she does it with so much happiness that when one looks at these works, 
one could feel her memory of that time. And she would also paint her environment, her home, the objects that she collected, the, her favorite things, her flower, her fruits, her, her little details. In other words, while Frida looked at her body, her suffering, her inability to have children, Maria looks at her, at her memories and at her surroundings. And then Remedios Varo and other artists like her, such as Leonora Carrington, uh, look at their dreams. They are considered surrealists. But Remedios Varo is a technical virtuoso. So she does all these scenes that are images that she has dreamed about, but she draws with such perfection that these dreams become real for us. Images like this labyrinth or uh, a shadow leaving us, right? The, the fact that we become the shadow and the shadow is animated and leaves. So this is a common dream. Many people have that. But Remedios Varo can actually paint it in a way that it becomes real for us. But these people that, that look not at things that are grandiose or heroic or social are certainly not only women. We have Julio Castellanos that does this beautiful work. It's included in every anthology of, of Mexican art. It's called The Day of St. John. And he puts these, this whole community that is having so much fun they're swimming, and, and, and you can see that so many stories are happening. Some are swimming, others are sunbathing. You know, uh, uh, this whole day is recreated. Or Agustin Lasso that paints normal people. This lady that is suing, so, you know, creating a shawl or Emilio Bass, it's called the left-handed uh, hairdresser. And again, there is nothing in any of these works uh, that you would seem to compare in social importance to what the muralists were doing. But the, the painting is beautifully executed. And you see the, the little left-handed hairdresser, and in the background you see a, a, another young person playing with a dove and a dog. Or the spiritual concerns of artists like Guillermo Mesa that does these images that are intriguing. I mean, I don't, this is not a, a common ritual in Mexico. People don't do that. They don't put cloths on their faces. And it's something that he thought of. We called it spiritual heads. And it works. Or Manuel Rodriguez Lozano that creates more realistic spiritual images. Now, uh, Antonio Ruiz El Corso deals with humor. His works are just fun. Like this image of this fat soprano that is giving a bad note. So you literally see a crow coming out of her mouth. 
And my favorite, Chucho Reyes Ferreira. Chucho Reyes Ferreira does these charming, exquisite works that are kind of naive, uh, uh, flowers and uh, roosters. Once they showed his works to Picasso and Picasso said, well, what a talented young man. And, you know, they told him, Mr. Picasso, you know, he's not really a young man. He's more or less about your age. <laughs> and then Picasso said, well, what a young old man. Tremendous compliment for Chucho Reyes Ferreira. So, so here you have the first generation of muralists and then these artists that are the, like looking intimately into themselves and their lives. And then you have a second generation of, of muralists that continue working in the tradition of Rivera, Orozco, and Siqueiros and do very important work, but are not as famous as the others. But still, uh, I would love to you to see their paintings. because They're just incredible. One of my favorites is called Gonzalez Camarena. Jorge Gonzalez Camarena had this idea of geometry. And he does these murals that are incredibly powerful with this excellent use of color, uh, images that are just so interesting. Uh, some years ago, this Russian group of uh, dissidents called uh, the Pussy Riot, these girls, you know, that were jailed by Putin because they had some kind of rebellious act in a Russian church. And these girls were mesmerized by the murals of Gonzalez Camarena. And many of the young people come and look at the tattoos of his models that are just incredible. That the woman in, to, your, to your left has the most incredible tattoos that are, again, something that Gonzalez Camarena researched and, and studied. But the way he presents his, his, his uh, this is a revolutionary, it's so interesting the posture of the man, the way that he represents his torso, the, the rifles behind him, the use of color, or this battle of a Spanish conquistador and an Aztec warrior. Very creative, very original, very interesting, and sadly, completely forgotten. Another muralist is Juan O'Gorman. And O'Gorman is perhaps the best draftsman I have ever seen. This is a self-portrait that he did. And he was also an architect. So his works have this perfection. Look at this. I mean, every square inch of the, and this is a large mural, is perfectly drawn. The shadows. Uh, and he does these marvelous, huge murals. Here you can see more or less the size of this one. This is in the University of Mexico. And if you look at the four, you see a real person. So that gives you a sense of the size of this mural that he did with mosaic. It's the entire library. Also only known by the expert. And the third is Paul O'Higgins. This guy, was an American white guy from Salt Lake City who one day saw an exhibit of Diego Rivera and fell in love with Mexico and decided that he was going to become an artist and he was going to become a Mexican. Just again, what I'm, I've always said, you know how Mexico is one of the most inclusive cultures because Diego Rivera of course took him under his wing and 
O'Higgins has these images of workers. He was very much inspired by the Mexicans and by Van Gogh. He does these lovely images. This is called The Boyfriend. And you look at this guy waiting for the girl under the tree. Or The Pilgrim. You know, uh, he went to live to Mexico and right before he died, he did this image of this pilgrim that is going back home somehow. But somehow, González Camarena, O'Higgins, O'Gorman, and then other artists that I have not included, but that, I, but that are very important too, such as Chávez Morado, Raúl Anguiano, uh, Arturo García Bustos, Alfredo Salsi, they more or less continue with the agenda of the original muralist, which is to paint social themes, historical, to have a kind of a social commitment, a political commitment. But somehow the great dissident in Mexican art would be Rufino Tamayo. Rufino Tamayo refuses to paint political themes. Tamayo believes that the revolution is a historical accident that could have happened in any country and therefore it's not intrinsically Mexican. So for Tamayo, the idea of Mexico had to be traced to the country's past. So Tamayo looks at the ancient art of Mexico and he tries to continue with that aesthetic. So what Tamayo's criticism to the muralist is, is says what matters is not to paint Indians, what matters is to rescue the indigenous aesthetic as if the conquest had never occurred. And that is exactly what he tries to do. So he does these murals and these paintings that continue the aesthetic of the original Mexicans. And he does these works that become pure color, images that are simple and beautiful, like this man that is looking at a galaxy. And Tamayo's art becomes very much embraced in the US, partly because he's not political. So his work is acquired by probably more collectors than the original muralists. And he becomes a very influential figure. Now, in the late 50s, there is another group of young artists that are also against all of the artists in Mexico. Because Somehow, all the art that I have shown to you so far is a celebration of Mexico. And there's different emphasis. Some put the emphasis on the history of Mexico. Others put the emphasis on the people or themselves. Or Tamayo that puts the emphasis on uh, the, the, the pre-Hispanic past. But these young group of people that would be known as the generation of La Ruptura, the big break, they say this luminous, beautiful, colorful Mexico is a fiction. The country we live in is horrible and corrupt and full of crime and this Mexico that they are painting 
is a country made for tourists. Cuevas, the most influential of these young artists, Jose Luis Cuevas, writes an essay called The Cactus Curtain. And he says, it is about time that Mexico crosses the cactus curtain. And so the, he does these brutal works. This is an image of a head that is full of worms. La cabeza agusanada. Or he paints criminals like the Borgias. This whole book of the most evil people in history. He uh, illustrates Kafka. He does these works that talk about crime, about corruption, about madness. And his pursuit resonates with a whole new generation. Artists like Rafael Coronel that paints rats and homelessness and madness and addiction. And somehow these rebellious artists anticipate the great youth movement of Mexico. Most of the time you have art following history, but in the case of Mexico, you have the case of art anticipating history. Somehow these rebellious artists in the early 50s, in late 50s, early 60s, that denounce injustice, that paint corruption, are somehow prefiguring what thousands of young people would do in the 60s. All these young people in 1968 that take the streets to demand democracy, to demand fair elections, to criticize governmental repression. This youth movement that is also of an international dimension because while the Mexican students were protesting in the streets, you had American students protesting in Chicago and French students protesting in Paris. But sadly, uh, the Mexican student movement is met by the horrible repression. The government of Mexico unleashes the army to massacre hundreds of students. We will never know how many. In a place called Tlatelolco, the order was given to shoot indiscriminately over the students. Their bodies disappeared. And many more were in prison. Look at the age of those kids in jail. These are those horrible repressions. Nowhere in the world were students repressed with the brutality that they were in Mexico in 1968. So after 1968, the reality becomes unbearable to paint. And most of the contemporary art that emerges is abstract. Works like Garcia Ponce, uh, Coronel, Lilia Carrillo, Enrique Echeverria, Aceves Navarro. And one of the most beautiful, an artist that just died a few months ago, Vicente Rojo. And Vicente Rojo 
did a whole series in many works, but this is called Mexico Under the Rain. And he did all these works that show us how does it feel to be under the rain. Now, sadly, the situation doesn't improve. You know, there is some change in the 70s, but in the 80s, uh, in 1985, we have a, a brutal earthquake that destroys large parts of, of Mexico's, Mexico City. And at the inefficiency of the government to solve the problem, people find that the most reliable help comes from other people. So you see this whole rebirth of social conscious. And after the earthquake and the massive economic crisis in which many people leave the country, many people emigrate, some die in the desert trying to get a better life. Others uh, rebel and the violence, uh, you have a whole surge in the drug trade and also in the weaponizing of the country. Tragically, Mexico is also a victim of the absurd policies of the US of letting anybody buy as many weapons as they want. So a lot of these cartels end up getting weapons that are stronger than those of the army. And so in this environment of, of violence, of death, of repression, art decentralizes. And in most of the time in the past, the most important artistic movements and exhibits and had happened in Mexico City. But now what is, begins to happen is that you're looking at movements in other parts of the country, in Monterrey, there is this whole new museum called Marco. It becomes a whole magnet for artists. In Tijuana, you have the Secut. Uh, you have a powerful artistic movements in Guadalajara and other movements like the Fil. In Zacatecas, you have also movements. But without question, the most important of these regional movements of decentralized art happens in Oaxaca. Headed by Francisco Toledo, that would emerge as the most important artist of his generation. Uh, Oaxaca would be a place that would produce some of the most exciting art in the contemporary world. Toledo would do these mythical representations in which he would blend his ideas of the ancient past with uh, sexual metaphors. In this case, you see this kind of ocean of penises or he would paint insects. And then you have Rodolfo Morales. Rodolfo Morales would do these large murals that recreate the life in, in the small town. And both Toledo and Morales become somehow like cultural patriarchs because a lot of the money that they earn, they reinvest in their hometowns. So Toledo, for instance, creates uh, a great library of, of art uh, a, a cultural institute, a library for the blind, uh, a center for photography. And Morales 
would restore many of the colonial buildings. So pretty much the entire country's dynamic changes. And there is not a single dominant style. So you have regional movements emerging. And then even within the central artistic movement, you have, on the one hand, art artists like La uh, Cauduro, that are these very realistic. And then you have artists like Arturo Rivera that are also realistic, but I would not call them hyper-realistic in, in the sense that some of, the, of this tendency to, to try to paint every pimple. These guys are, I mean, have a solid command of drawing, obviously, but their work is informed by fantasy, by myth. There is also great conceptual artists. And the most famous, of course, would be uh, Gabriel Orozco. He would reimagine games. For example, he would do this, uh, table of pool where what the central ball is moved by gravity. So you're like, like playing against gravity. What a cool idea you know, to think of, of a way that you're playing and then you have the gravitational pull of the other ball. Or he would do this work that would be exhibited in, the, in MoMA in New York, where he got a little small piece of gum and he rolled it over New York and he came and he gave them that ball that picked up all the trash on its way from his house to the museum. Or images like this one where he would recreate the landscape of Manhattan with little pieces of trash that he would later photograph. He would do this self-portrait and they asked him to do a self-portrait. And he puts his hands and he opens them and it has the form of his heart. And he would do large public works like this skeleton of a whale at the entrance of Mexico's new uh, central library. Now, conceptual art in Mexico is also very extended. And you have uh, all kinds of things. One of the most interesting one is of Marcos R, an artist from Baja California, that did this huge like Trojan horse and put it there very close to the San Isidro border. Like this idea that art is not the object, it's not the horse, art is the idea that triggers conversation and other ideas. In the past decades, if originally painting was the great public art, in the recent decades, sculpture has become the dominant form of expression. And some artists such as Jose Luis Cuevas have also, also became sculptors. And he created this giantess that is as deformed and interesting as his earlier drawings. Some of these new sculptures are figurative, like the Marine Brothers, Jorge, that does many images, but some of the most famous ones are these images of these winged creatures that have this mask, like if they were in a carnival. And his brother, Javier Marin, that does these uh, images of men and women. And then of course you have Sebastian that does these large abstract forms that exist all over Mexico. My favorite is this one of this great fish. And you can get a sense of the size of this by looking at those uh, birds in front. <laughs> 
But what I consider the masterpiece of contemporary Mexico is a great ecological work, El Espacio Escultorico. The sculptural space is a sculpture, but it is also an ecological work and a conceptual work. So the idea of these artists was to find the crater of a volcano. This is in Mexico City. And so they cleaned the stones and then they put these pyramids all around the crater. And so you walk and while you walk, you see the stone. You look at the sculpture of nature. It is something extraordinary. Uh, it is a place where people have done concerts, where people come to think. I can't tell you how beautiful it is to grab a good book and go to the Espacio Escultorico. Uh, the crater changes with the time of the year. Uh, and it is an extraordinary experience, a work that is at once physical and spiritual. It is a collective work by seven different artists. So I would like to conclude uh, this presentation uh, by remembering as we look at images of Mexican art from the cave paintings in Baja California to the great Aztec calendar or the colonial masterpieces. I like to remember this idea that is expressed by Octavio Paz in the introduction to the exhibit Splendors of 30 Centuries. And what Paz says is that childhood is the promise of form. Youth is the splendor of form. Old age is the decay of form. And death is the fall into formlessness losing form, becoming ashes. So behind every sculpture, behind every poem, behind every painting, what you really are seeing is the desire to create a form that will survive death, that will survive time and its ravages, to create a now that will be there forever. When you look at the art of any country, of any people, what you are looking at is the desire of that people to conserve something of their essence for the future. What you're looking at is the desire to live. Thank you.